in this country just through the construction process. So this isn't talking about the garbage we collect in our house. Just in the construction uh, industry, uh, we generate enough waste, construction debris, to build a wall 30 feet high and 30 feet deep around the entire coast of North America. At what point are we going to run out of room because we've just got trash everywhere? Um, Two-thirds of the lakes and half the rivers in, in Tennessee are, are classified as too polluted to swim because of the construction process and things we do improperly in building that the air inside of our buildings is oftentimes five times more polluted than the air outside. Air inside non lease certified buildings uh, has been defined as toxic. That's attributed to primarily the adhesives and the sealants that we use in, in primary materials of buildings. Not allowing somebody to open a window, for instance, pretty simple things, but when you think about it, you hermetically seal a building and then you fill it with all this toxic stuff and then you don't give fresh air to the HVAC system, all you're doing is circulating some toxic pollutants around the building and breathing that all day. The, the EPA has, has said nationwide that there's 100 million people that live in areas where the air is classified as unfit to breathe. That's their actual classification. Uh, that's a third of the population of the United States on any given day breathing in air that's bad. Because this valley holds a lot of those coal-fired uh, electrical generation plants for the, from this region. It holds a lot of that pollution in here. Buildings, uh, on average, contribute about 45% of, uh, of all of the uh, pollution and energy consumption uh, problems in the United States. I think if you, if you look back to, to old architecture, uh, you, know, you, you don't have to go back that far, but even if you went back 100 years, um, buildings were actually natural things. We, we didn't have a, a rail system like we do now. We didn't have a freight system. We couldn't ship products from China over here. And so uh, buildings were really uh, comprised of the elements that were found within a few miles of the building. Um, the, the block that was made was made from clay close by. Uh, the lumber was all fell, you know, close by. And so to me, that's the most natural a building can be is when it's, when it's regionally based like that. Looking at a lead building, I, I think you want to you wanna quickly kind of look at, look at everything about the building. You know, are, are you building a hundred year building? Are you building a building that's going to be around for a for, for hundred years? Um, what has this site traditionally been? Um, what's going to go on inside these buildings? You ask a lot of questions, oddly enough, that architects used to ask about a building. Um, you know, back in the day, they would, uh, they, would, they would ask all these questions. They would know all this information before they designed a building. Now, uh, in, in recent history, we, we, we kind of got away from that. And, you know, we said, what is this building going to be for the next two years? What's this building going to be for the next five years? So really backing up and looking at and asking the questions of, you know, what does this building want to be? What impacts is it, is it going to have on the land around it? I think are all important things to, to ask and look at. In the 15 odd years that I've been practicing architecture, uh, the first 10 of which uh, the, leads, the lead rating system, the United States Green Building Council, was not a prominent uh, means of either accreditation or certification of any building. Uh, part of my career was simpler. I look back at that and think, boy, we were doing things so simply and almost uh, irresponsibly. What uh, my goal is in, in, in working in, in projects is to, is to build a building, the outside it, as tight and as friendly as you can, and then fill it with things that, um, that are recycled or recyclable. The five main categories of lead then would uh, be uh, site and uh, this uh, site construction, uh, building and materials, uh, materials mm -hmm. use. Uh, in, uh, energy and atmosphere, and uh, indoor air quality, and then innovation and design. What a, what a lot of people don't know, um, you know, we, we live in a city that's blessed with a river that almost entirely rings us, and most of the people that come into downtown, they drive across this river. And so they see, you know, we've got all this water, and we've got all this uh, clean water, and, and, and I don't really have to conserve that water. It's there. Um, what most people don't know is that when you turn on a faucet, that water coming out, 
90% of the cost of that water, 90% of your bill that pays for that water actually goes to electricity that pumps that water around. So anytime we reduce water, um, we're, we're, we're reducing uh, energy and, and energy, especially with coal fire plants, which is the majority of what fuels our building. We're, re we're reducing air particulates and, and we're not polluting as much. The fixtures uh, that we particularly look at first are those low cost fixtures uh, and those fixtures that would go into a LEED certified building uh, are the common fixtures that are available on the market are those uh, toilet fi fixtures that reduce uh, the amount of uh, potable water demand on the building. A lot of times they can reduce that demand up to half uh, of a normal uh, fixture. Waterless urinal fixtures uh, for men's restrooms uh, do away with water consumption. Um, you know, your low flow faucets and sometimes faucets that uh, turn off when the occupant pulls the hand away or occupancy censored uh, faucets reduce water by half. We also catch all of our rainwater, which normally would go into this combined system and be uh, purified for no reason before it's put in the river. And um, we actually collect that water on site and we treat it to, we actually treat it to culinary standards, which are higher than potable water standards. We use it to shower with in our office. We use it in our sink. We use it to water our plants outside. So we've almost cut out the middleman, and, and we certainly cut out the middleman as it relates to additional pollution. As I mentioned earlier, they're about 2% to 3% greater. Uh, but the long-term cost, which is what we call life cycle costs, which are some of the things that we've been doing for clients, life cycle costs looked at, at first-time costs versus their payback is, is a term that you often hear. Is it a payback that's five years? A lot of people say, geothermal and a lot of these uh, energy systems that are coming online right now that are becoming very popular have a payback of a certain amount of time and most of those are about the five year to ten year range. Uh, solar has, a, has probably about the same if not more. Uh, most of uh, the grants that are available right now between the federal government and state governments allow that to be about five years. Before that uh, was available all of those grants not being available was more like a 10 to 20 years time span in payback. Environment 2030 or um, Architecture 2030, which is to say that um, it, its proclamation is that we will have net zero buildings by 2030, uh, pr predominantly in the United States. And that's, that's a pretty lofty goal, but if you think about it, the, the, with the technology improvements that we have right now, it's, it's, it's very doable. Riverfront professionals, uh, for instance, we're, we are reducing in a yearly, at a yearly rate, 276 tons of CO2 emissions from that one building. Well, what if we go net zero? Then you're talking 500 to 800,000 tons of CO2 emissions. And you take 20% of those buildings that we're building and reduce that. And all of a sudden, we're getting the air cleaner. I think if we um, do that, we'll get cleaner water, cleaner <coughs> air, and uh, more sustainable buildings, buildings that last a lot longer, and uh, that people, because they can occupy them, because they're healthier, will occupy them for longer periods of time. Um, LEED not only is a, a better way to build a building, um, I see it as hopefully becoming commonplace, that, that before you know, my children are in elementary school, that all buildings will be LEED certified at a minimum. Any career that you choose, uh, you're going, you have a responsibility to society, to the environment, and to your, the, your next generation. And I'm happy to see architects, engineers, and allied professionals take on this role and um, become very engaged in this dialogue about how we build buildings better, and how we build safer, and how we build healthier, and how we build more sustainable. stuff we have out of all these tapes.